Marco, should we should we just you know just a quick start the just give 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 the background for the topic? I know you know many folks are here you know developers like us, so probably they they are super eager to to, to, <laughs> to you know to to start this discussion to uh, you know to 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 really you know be, be, because you know even even I remember when I started I I I. You know, I read those books, right? You know, grew up on those books, and so, so, and, and, and okay, well, maybe you know, uh, like, like uh, while I was, you know, progressing, sort of, on, you know, in my career, I, I figured out that well, you know, some things are definitely, you know, not as simple as you know as are in the books, but, um, uh, you know, uh, well, yeah. So let's just, you know, start, uh, Marco. Sure. Um, well, I, I'll. I wanted to let Casey do the, the the an overview, but I'll. I can probably give that give that a go. Um, I think in in that video, so the, the the argument was that a lot of the common uh, suggestions that are made in uh, architecture books, uh, architecture books, don't necessarily lend themselves well to to producing performant code. And, and Casey went through a few examples of, of transforming uh, classical uh, hierarchy, class hierarchy from to use basically uh, switch statements and, uh, and a few other optimizations that led to, to go from, I can't remember the exact same number, the exact numbers, but let's say a few orders of magnitude faster. And, and obviously, a lot of folks on the internet kind of um, disagreed with that approach and argued that in the, the reason that those approaches were, were developed in the first place was to basically allow more productivity on the developer side uh, rather than optimizing for machine cycles. And I guess, yeah, that, that's where a lot of people uh, not necessarily disagree, but maybe have different views of, of what's more, more important. And uh, I'm not sure if, we, if, we, if we'll have a place with, with links, but uh, there, there was an interesting di discussion between Casey and Bob Martin, which was, I think, the coined at least the phrase of clean code, and he wrote a book on it, which was a very <laughs> nice, long, and civil discussion. Um, yeah, it can, seems that Marco. I'm sorry. Can, can can you just briefly, you know, give an overview? Like, what were the main points, you know, kind of of defense uh, from Bob Martin, and you know, what what were the points of, of attack, like from from Casey, if if if, if we can call it, you know, an, an attack or a defense? <laughs> right. Uh, I think it, it eventually boils down to um, what. The, so they were discussing. Um, let's see if I can find the exact. Um, Right, because nomenclature. Again, right? So, so, so the point Casey was trying to make, right? So, you know, clean code, horrible performance, right? So that's basically, you know, what what he was trying to. Oh, we 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 have Casey joined yeah. finally. Yeah. Cool. Now, so let him do the overview. <laughs> yeah. Is this the book? Yes, that's that's exactly the book that we are talking about. Clean code, yes. Uh, Casey, you can request the the mic, and then you can. Uh start with giving us an overview of, of your main, the main thrust of your, your video. So I only just barely heard anything that you folks were saying because I had to install Twitter on my phone uh, to access the spaces. I'll start with a brief rant here because I think this pretty much encapsulates everything that I tend to talk about but somehow get pushback on still, which honestly kind of boggles my mind. So in order to participate in this space, I was sitting at a desktop computer with a microphone I use podcasting, recording videos, doing Twitch streams, like I used every service there. But apparently I can't use it for Twitter because for whatever reason, you can't speak in a Twitter space on Twitter on a desktop. So I had to go install it on my phone. I installed it on my phone and authorized the application and all that. But then the application didn't even have a list to show me what spaces I was already following, like that I had a reminder set for. Instead, the only thing that you could pull up was a list of you know, other spaces. So 
you had to give me a link, but there's nowhere to put that link in the Twitter app. So I had to go to a web browser, put the link in, then click on open in application in the web browser to go back to Twitter to finally find the space. Now, the reason I bring up that ridiculousness is because the thing that I am always told is that the reason that we need all of these things that make performance very slow is because it's supposed to make programmers very productive and make things that are like better or bug free or have more features. But everything I use today is more buggy, less feature laden, and takes forever to use like that, like that exact experience. So where is this supposed benefits materializing, right? When we talk about performance and we get this pushback, how is it possible that you still use applications today and basic stuff like I can't use my microphone on the desktop or I have to go manually enter this web address because they don't have a list of spaces? How are apps still this bad? So just as sort of a writer on this conversation, I would like to say that that sort of thing is endemic to the software industry right now. So. I would challenge people who constantly tell me these things about performance when I'm talking about just modest things we could do to pr improve performance. Like, where are the benefits? Where are these benefits that you claim that we are getting? Because the software I use today is not just slow, it's also feature like barren. It can't even do basic things. And I'll point out another thing. I couldn't use the microphone on the desktop, but I can on a phone. Another benefit I'm always told is, you know, cross-platform. Why is this in the web browser? Oh, well, we just write it once. No, you didn't, right? It doesn't work the same on the two platforms. So that's not the answer. So I feel like there's a lot of just disingenuous arguing that goes on with performance. When you talk about it, people make all these claims that are obviously false. If you use software for even 15 minutes, you know that all the things they're saying are just absolutely excuses because the proof would be in the pudding and the pudding tastes disgusting. So that said, rant over, and I'm happy to now engage with what other questions you had. <laughs> no, Casey, there was, I think, a, a, lot, a lot that you said. Uh, uh, or should we, should we kind of, you know, go step by step really distill what what you said because well so the part when 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 you kind of you know blaming the software modern software for being you know feature feature you know uh, barren uh, yeah and you know like buggy well i mean we cannot blame clean code for that right we, we can yes absolutely so, so sorry we, we can or we cannot we can we can the reason we can, so why, why yes, I, I'm happy to elaborate on that. So previously programming, you know, I would say in the 1980s, uh, it had not really changed that much yet. By the 90s, it kind of had. So previously programming was about trying to get the computer to do something. So when you were talking about programming, what you were usually talking about is how do I get the computer to do this thing? So the focus was on, for example, I need the computer to access the microphone. So what I'm thinking about right now is how do I get the computer to access the microphone? Unfortunately, a lot of the software movements that grew up around that time period, and I, th I think I understand why they grew up around that time period. So we can talk about that later. But a lot of the software movements became not about how do you get the computer to do something, but rather abstract notions of what it means to be a good program. Clean code, for example, is exactly such a methodology. Very little in any of those methodologies are about actually accomplishing the task that you set out to accomplish. They do not analyze things like how likely was the microphone to actually work if you, for example, make these classes and do all this extra work to like isolate these things and obey solid principles and so, so on and so forth. Nobody ever actually stopped to analyze, do those things actually result in more features implemented per unit time, or do they just result in more code? Now, from all the analysis I've ever done, and I have actually shipped software both ways, it's the complete opposite of what is claimed. When you focus on things that are not 
getting the code to work. And instead, you place the complete focus on abstract notions of what is clean code, whether you use the quote unquote clean code methodology or whether you just have this abstract notion of clean code that you have not measured then what ends up happening is programmers have a tremendous amount of their mental space and their actual day-to-day -day work taken up with activities that do not improve the quality of the code that they actually ship as far as features and reliability to the customer. Now, examples of this are myriad. How many people out there listening to space right now can relate to the idea that they've had to be in a code review at some point where they literally spent like an hour talking about something that just does not matter. Like it does not affect what the computer does at the end of the day. It's just some syntactic thing that somebody who was doing the code review just thinks is important for clean code. Like what exactly was private section or whether or not that thing should have been a virtual function or an if statement. And so when we teach programmers right from the get-go, like right from their CS education, and then reinforce it with blog posts and Twitter threads and all these other things, that there is an abstract notion of clean code that has all these weird things associated with it that no one has ever proven, like creating lots of classes and separating everything into its own file, having all the functions be extremely small, not taking parametric uh, enumerants and functions, uh, having to... Um, make sure everything obeys like Liskov substitution principles, all these things. And then we pile on languages with thousands of features maybe supposed to do these things like modern C++ and so on. That huge cognitive load absolutely subtracts from the number of people who are able to participate in actually getting the computer to work. And another thing, if you look at the processes that we've put in place, you can see developers who their entire day and discussing slash arguing what they're going to do to the code on like a GitHub issue. You will see developers who post so many GitHub issues and argue back and forth about how to do things that there's no way they're doing any work during the day. Like it's just not gonna happen, right? And so we, we have definitely created where we're valuing all sorts of other things that were put there because we claim that they produce better software. But all of the evidence that I have seen, all of it, is that they produce dramatically worse software and nobody wants to admit it. It's not just about performance. Performance is but one casualty of this terrible, terrible habit that we've developed and that shows no sign of slowing thing about being <laughs> spending <laughs> endless hours in meetings with developers and it's it, the conversation has nothing to do with what the code is supposed to be doing i've once spent more than an hour in a meeting with the arguing about dependency injection yes yes exactly uh, but so th that's actually a good point of one of one of the points i had in the, in the kind of list of uh things to discuss. Is that a, a symptom more, rather than software development as a practice, more of a, I want to say, the way that companies are structured, meaning that the way the company is structured and it's subdivided into teams reflects onto how code is, over time, is being developed, necessarily the way that um, people want to develop code. So because you have all of these different teams, and especially now the companies have a large number of software engineers working on different parts of the of, of an application or different applications even, and they have to talk to each other, uh, both in person and through code, but then to, to kind of um, simplify the process, we create these black boxes that we have to trust and create these abstractions and interfaces that lead, I, as claim to, to better software and better code and better productivity. But in reality, that's that's not the case. Is that, do you think that's a fair assessment? Uh, no, I don't. So the reason I don't think that's a fair assessment is because, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm a big believer in Conway's law. I think it's actually a law, probably. Um, it's as close to a law as we've ever seen in architecture anyway. Uh, and for folks who don't know what Conway's law is, just I'll briefly mention what it is. 
Conway's law says that organizations always ship copies of themselves effectively. Uh, that's a bit of a trivialization of it. And I did a whole video on Conway's law, which, you know, I can point people to if they want more information. It's 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 richer than that and a, and a better law than just that. But for purposes of this conversation, uh, that's sort of what it says. And the reason that it says that, of course, is because you like you sort of uh, mentioned in the question, there's going to be a structure company, and that structure is going to have certain communication lines drawn into it that are based on the structure of the company, not the structure of the products that it ships. And because it is very difficult to innovate or optimize across those lines, all of the products that that company ships will bear that same structure at a minimum, right? So to what you're saying, and uh, the part of, of your question that I definitely agree with, is that the structure of a company does affect the software that they ship. So if there's going to be an audio team and a video team, then you can basically bet that the two components that we ship will be audio and video, right? <laughs> because that's just how we organized our company. We won't ship a combined audiovisual module because the teams will have developed them sort of separately and there will be a API or something in between them. That's just how it's going to go. And you can see this uh, play itself out. It's pretty much universally true. You can look at the org chart for Microsoft and lo and behold, that same org chart will materialize inside the design of Windows, right? However, that is the minimum amount of code division we could do, meaning the fact that there is, for example, a direct sound team or something, which at this point, it would be X audio team or whatever it is, at Windows is just saying that, well, that means that X audio is going to have an API to the rest of the world. It doesn't say anything about how X audio has to be divided internally. And so, even if we go all the way down to the actions of a single programmer, nowadays we'll see is the single programmer who obviously doesn't have any Conway's law imposition upon them because they are writing the code that they are writing. They don't have to communicate with themselves across a slow channel. They have a fast channel inside their own brain. We'll still often, because they have been taught to do so, not necessarily because they themselves came up with this idea, they will micro like slice what they make into hundreds sometimes of unnecessary classes and uh, you know components and containers and this that and the other thing because that's what they've been told to do to make the code either quote unquote clean or good or to pass a code review or whatever right and so i don't think that it's just conway's law in action i think there is a limit that you hit where you will hit Conway's law, and you can't offer development any further than that. You could optimize company development further than that, but you couldn't optimize software development further than that. But I think that limit is very far away from the code quality we have right now. Conway's law has been in effect for eternity because it's a law. Why weren't they having this problem in 1973? The answer is because no one told them to do this kind of stuff in 1973. So when they sat down to program, focused on getting the computer to do the program, they didn't think, oh, and also, here's this 97 other things I can do, which I can't measure the efficacy of, but that I'm going to prioritize over getting the microphone to actually work in a Twitter space. Guys, uh... Uh, should we should we maybe you know go back to uh, to performance you know since uh, we we I guess you know right so focusing on the topic right clean code horrible performance right and Casey mm -hmm. so if we go back to like you know 1997 I don't know uh, like at the time where where those you know clean code principles were kind of you know um, set up right so like w w were they were they wrong at the beginning like and and were were those clean code principles were just wrong yes uh they were definitely wrong uh so here is how i would describe it so i basically the original design of c++ and java i, I would not date it back to 1997 and i wouldn't the clean code principles were the things that started the wrongness right um what I would say is the idea behind sort of this uh, particular implementation of object-oriented programming 
which of course, because one thing I'll point out is when we talk about clean code, you have to be very specific because some people are like, like, no, no, my code is very performant and it's clean. It's like, well, everyone has their own definition of this in various places. So when you talk about clean code, you have to be careful to say what you're actually referring to, because it could be that someone thinks clean code is, is code that I would also have thought was clean if I defined that term, right? So we do have to be careful about what we're talking about. But let me rewind the clock a little further. So the ideas behind C++ or C with classes, the original version, uh, were all wrong, I think. My understanding is they came from Simula 66 or something like this, a language that I don't have any experience with. But if you go back and look at the history, you know, there was a lineage there. It wasn't like uh, Strewstrip sat down and was like, hey, I don't know, I got this idea, let's run with it, right? Um, but C++ and then Java, which of course had a huge marketing campaign behind it and was widely adopted, I think had a lot more to do with these things than say clean code, right? Clean code actually contains within it some things that I would agree with, right? Like I think that naming identifiers sensibly, right? That makes a lot of sense. And I don't see a lot of ways that it like hurts software development, especially now that we have autocomplete it's hard to argue that like typing in one letter variable names for anything, everything would somehow be an improvement, right? So there are, so it's not like clean code taken as a corpus is exclusively bad. However, the main things that are bad about software design currently are also contained in clean code. But if we wanna focus on them more exclusively, we'd go back to Java and C++'s design. Because I think that's what really started it off because those languages became very popular. Both of them were marketed quite heavily, C++ informally, Java formally with like a huge budget. And I think that really pushed the industry kind of into that, if that makes sense. So just laying that groundwork, those implementations do not solve problems. The idea that classes with virtual functions and inheritance hierarchies are a good way to design software, in my opinion, is completely false. It was false at the time, and it's still false today. It just shouldn't be done. There's almost always, in pretty much every circumstance, something else you would rather do. Now, keep in mind, I'm talking about a specific implementation. Obviously, the idea of function pointers isn't a bad idea. I use it, I think it's okay. But the idea that in general you create these things and those things have in them something you can't see, like, because remember, Java and C++, it's kind of invisible to you that this is going on, C++ especially, it puts in a vtable pointer somewhere, you don't know where it points off to a vtable whose format you don't necessarily control and which is in a place that you don't control, right? And this is how your program is supposed to work. And then we have this inheritance that allows us to sort of create that vtable through implicit actions that actually have nothing to do with creating a vtable, right? It's not control over the vtable, it's this indirect activity of creating this hierarchy that then produces this vtable. So that's, that was sort of the design methodology of C++ that got pushed forward to Java in a big way. Now, this is just a bad idea. I think it was bad the entire time. The reason that I think people thought maybe that it was potentially a good idea or be, the, the reason maybe, let's, how should I put this? The reason that it, it catches on and that people think it solves a problem is because I do think at that time, we had not really thought about or codified the kinds of good architectures that do without using that kind of code. Meaning the average person had never thought about the concept of what we would now, for example, today call data-oriented design or something like that. They hadn't thought about the idea that you can actually make code that is easy to extend, easy to maintain, and easy to read without those things. So someone comes along and says to you, you make these inheritance hierarchies and your code is more maintainable. Well, most people never measure that fact, right? And the thing that they're coming from is not having any guidance on how to create a actual program that's easy to maintain. So if your choice, especially initially, remember, like if a company is gonna make this decision, if your choice is between someone who's not saying anything, because nobody who 
what nobody was pushing the C language or something or an other alternative to C language and telling you it's more maintainable and offering you a different option that you could evaluate between. If all you're handed is this weird inheritance hierarchy stuff, but you're told it's more maintainable and that the code is better or something like that, you can understand why it gets adopted because some methodology is usually better than no methodology, right? And I don't think anyone would argue, including me, that having absolutely no methodology is very no, dangerous Casey, because you are Casey, very sorry, likely to go there, right? Sorry, but let me let me stop you here. So just sure. you know, j j just a quick example, right? So so suppose you see a code like right, you know, like giant if else statement, right? So would you, yes. would you rather prefer to see like you know a a virtual function call and everything collapsed inside you know under the hood of that virtual you know function implementation? I mean, I, I, I don't no, think, I, I, I definitely, I, I definitely wouldn't. No, idea, right? so the, the, that's no, a good idea. I, I mean, you, you, you would want to hide that kind of complexity, you know, and not what, not overwhelm the readers of that code, you know, with all the tiny details of particular implementation of that virtual function, right? Well, what you just said is an example of what I just said happened, right? So what you're saying is the only two options are a piece of code that has eight thousand if statements in it or a virtual function. But it's not. I could instead just take that code and factor it into more functions. If you feel like these if statements are redundant or shouldn't be read in line, you can pull them out into just a regular function, right? Because the idea that somehow pulling them into virtual functions, I mean, just think of it this way. How many pieces of code are there in both cases? The same number. You have the same number of things in the if statement case, the same number of basic blocks as you do in the virtual function case. It's just in the if statement case, they're in, in an order, right? I read them in order. In the virtual function case, they're put into several separate files inside classes that I have to go find now when I want to know what they do. And so all I'm saying is if you found that thing to be unreadable or you think that those if statements are being duplicated, like they're being duplicated across the code, which is another problem, that's not a problem you need virtual functions to solve. Just put those into static functions that you call or regular functions that you call. Just don't make them virtual because then there's this sort of extra added thing that's this inheritance hierarchy, which is a bunch of typing for no actual reason. Yeah, that makes sense to me. But um, I, I, you see, like, okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, speaking from, 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 uh, from you know someone who tries to find the middle ground because I don't necessarily think you know, you know that all those you know clean code you know stuff is bad right but just uh, but 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 as you well as you showed and you know and many others showed right uh, clean code not always lead to good performance but can we can we you know just find the middle ground here I mean only only like make those parts of the code clean that do not necessarily you know, need to be performant. I mean, no, because it's also worse for features. I think that was what I started out this rant by trying to say. So I don't think anyone looks to see whether the things they claim are clean code actually are easier to work with. Like, uh, go look at LLVM, right? There's the, the they, I don't know what I, I would call it, the poster child for inheritance hierarchies and you never know what's going on, right? They did exactly what you said. Instead of having if statements or things you could follow in line, they just everything's a virtual function and everything's a class. It's impossible to do anything in that code base. It's you have to step through the debugger for like an hour just to find out how anything works. And also, by the way, it's extraordinarily slow, which of course is exactly what you'd expect, but you know, that's kind of a separate issue. So you look at stuff like this, and I'm like, no, like like it's not a question of middle ground. If you want your code to be easier to maintain and you find well, yourself writing all of these if statements and you I mean, don't I mean, like that, there are other sorry, options besides sorry, virtual sorry, functions and inheritance hierarchies, right? Sorry, Casey, going back to the LVM. Well, okay, so I, I spent, you know, a few years, you know, working on the LVM code base. So I, I yeah. I, uh, so I mean, well, so the reason why L LVM is slow is, is just, just because there's, you know, a bunch of pointers and, and you know, you, you know, you, you always miss in caches, you know, you, you, there's a bunch of indirections. Uh, virtual function calls. Well, okay, maybe that's a problem as well. Uh, I, I, you know, I haven't measured that, but, but uh, okay. So I, I'm just trying to 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 figure out how would you solve it, you know, without, um, without you know, kind of, uh, or you know, how would you solve it other way? Like if 
suppose if if you know if 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 we would throw out all this cleanness from the LVM code base, will it be faster? Well, of course it'll be faster, but I think it will also be easier to work with. I'm trying to say. So there's two things. Let's address them both. Number one, virtual function calls are just part of the problem. So if you like in my video, for example, the fact that it has to do a virtual call is not really why it's slow, right? The reason why it's slow is because virtual function calls can't be optimized across. I mean, that's where the slowness comes from. Every time you make a virtual call, you put a hard line in that the compiler can't optimize across. So what happens is it can't merge all of the code. I mean, let's take a very simple example, right? Suppose I've got a virtual class. Well, I, I, no, it's not a virtual class, but a class with virtual function calls. So suppose I have a class with virtual function calls and virtual function calls. One is like get size, and the other is like get count. And all I do is multiply them together, right? Well, that cost of doing the two virtual function calls, yeah, maybe that's bad. It probably is, but it, it's probably not that bad. The cost of it not knowing that it actually only had to check the type of this thing once because it's going to do two virtual calls to it, that's the actual cost because now it can't merge those two things together. A switch statement, for example, it can just merge. If you have two switch statements that do the same thing, run right after you know, it, it, one right after each other, or two if statements that check the same condition, one right after each other, the compiler just merges those together, and now it can optimize across those two things. That's the real virtual functions. Is that if you have a code base with tons and tons and tons of virtual functions, none of this stuff gets merged, right? So right. no, first no, of all, no, performance-wise, so, so with the, that, right? Yeah, anyway. I'm, yeah, I mean, he, here I agree with you. You know, like, like yeah. lack of lack of aligning, you know, of, of uh, virtual functions is 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 a huge problem. I, I you know, I I, I yeah. did definitely agree here. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So the second part of your question, the second part of your question, I think, is that you, if I understand it correctly, it's like, can, can you make it? Well, it's not really the second part of your question. I guess the second part of my answer to your question, which was saying, it's easier to work with when you do this. So let's talk about what virtual functions actually do. So virtual functions, all they can do is the one operation that you wrote the virtual function to do, right? So the user of the code who is going to use a class that's opaque, that has to use these virtual functions, what that means is that you've pushed, there, there's a decision point, right? Anytime you design any piece of code, if you were designing an actual API for a particular use case, there is a decision point that's continuous. And it's continuous in the following way. I can expose 100% of the details to the person who's going to use this thing, whatever it is. I can, I can do 0% of the details, or I can do something in between, right? There's always that continuum, and it's your choice. Clean code, in general, and for example, the design of the LLVM code base, is about pushing that needle very far towards the 100%. That's why everything is its own class, and there's virtual everything, and the inheritance hierarchy is so crazy that I've only ever seen small parts of it, meaning if you actually tried to graph the entire thing, I don't even want to know what it would look like. But even just, a, just the operator class, right? has so many things in it with so many lines that it takes you like several minutes to actually read them in a diagram, let alone in code. Now, when you write code with just regular discriminated unions, like, you know, like a tagged union, like someone would do who came from like, I don't know, like category theory or just who likes programming with unions. When you do something like that, you have a lot more options because you're exposing the type to the outside layer and you're saying you can do more complex things with this. You can also do this, for example, right? When you program with those options, it puts more abilities in the person using whatever it is that you've provided to do combinations of things. You can say things very easily like, oh, if this thing has an X and that thing has a Y, then I'm going to do this, right? And it's very easy to read that. It's very easy for the compiler to understand what's going on because there aren't virtual functions. And the only way to mimic that sort of thing with the inheritance version is to make those things be virtual functions. Like I call, do you have an X? Do you have a Y? Do you support Z? Which then 
not only is that more confusing typically to people because it's there's a lot more you know calling functions and what does that function do as opposed to just looking like is type this right but it also means that now the compiler can't optimize any of those things so I, I just don't see the win. I don't see what they're getting by introducing all of this artificial complexity when really all that you needed there was just to say what you actually wanted to do in the code. If the code wanted to know whether this thing was that or this other thing was that, just put in a field that says what those things are and let everyone check it. I mean, that's what's happening anyway. You can't... I mean, there's tons of things in LLVM that we've had examples where they're like, well, why don't we just change this? And they're like, we can't. It's too hard, right? Because we right. baked that into the Casey, design. So, you yep. know, I mean. Uh -huh. yeah. Casey, uh, sorry, so, so just... before, before you I'm go. Sorry, uh, sure. I think one, and I'm arguing kind of a, I, I tend to agree, but I'm going to argue the uh, playing at devil's advocate here. I think one of the reasons that, people go with classes and, and C++ especially pushes you to, to use classes is that what they call, they try to achieve at least to, to an extent type safety, meaning that rather than having a type embedded in basically a void star or a, a union, you you have a class that that you, you, it's very well defined and again can be checked for compile time and you have possibly better guarantees that it's not going to misbehave. I know that's not the case, but that's one of the arguments that sometimes comes up when, when talking about inheritance and polymorphisms and, and all of that, is that you have a better type safety compared maybe to the to the other approach with switch and if statements. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it really depends, I guess, on which language you're talking about. But yes, in C++, I know they did add standard variant, which I believe is designed to fix that problem. But I mean... Uh, all I can say is there are trade-offs to anything you're going to do. And my question would be, let's suppose that for some reason your language doesn't have a way of helping you do this for some reason. Again, just wrap that in a function. Just wrap it in a regular function because that's all the virtual function is doing for you anyway. If what you're really worried about is that someone's going to access a member of this union incorrectly, wrap that in a regular function. Done. Problem solved, right? No, Casey. No, I, I, I think what I was trying to say about LVM, right? So, so, but uh, I'm sorry, L but, but wait. LVM. Before we go, can, can 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 does that answer the question that was asked, though? Yep. Yep. Okay. No, so, Casey, you see, so what what I'm trying to say is that you know some problems are just in, in, inherent, you know, to the workload. Like you cannot, you okay? So even if you get rid of the polymorphism, right, and put put everything into static functions, I mean, the, uh, like, you know, the memory in directions will not go away because, so, you know, uh, it's just the nature of the compilation, right? So so when you compile function A, you need to know some information about function B uh, and, you, and you don't have that information ahead of time. You have to check it in, at runtime, right? That's why you have a lot of those, you know, memory references and the cal uh, and cache misses and all, and, and, you know, in all of that, right? You have to absolutely have to make those you know, memory accesses, right? You cannot avoid those. And they, they will be there, you know, whether you will program in a clean way, they will be also there if you just, you know, put everything into the static functions, right? No, I mean, absolutely not. So you have to remember that if you design code with these inheritance hierarchies like LLVM has, there's no way to come in after the fact and now go, okay, Let's take a look at what the actual workload is on a typical compile. And let's go ahead and actually start to figure out how we can optimize these things, right? Because what you're supposing is that actually all of these cache misses and all of these indirections were not only necessary, but also couldn't be optimized down to fitting into other caches more or doing less branches, computing both sides of some of these ifs and then just using one of them, right, going wide. I mean, for example, if you take a look at how you do modern high-performance GPU programming, not very often modern CPU programming because we haven't gotten there yet on it and also because gathers aren't as good as they should be on, you know, x64, but uh, if you look at that, you're like, there's all these things that LLVM can't even try, right? They just can't even try. 
And that's because, again, it's like there's no way we're ever like I, I don't even know how to start to try to do that because the architect up means we'll never know. Right now, what we do know is that other people who've written compilers blow them out of the water. Right. So, I mean, looking at, for example, the way that, you know, something like JAI works, right, it's way, way fail. Now, I don't know if that's because there was something that has to happen in Clang that doesn't happen in this other language or something. So, you know, I can't just tell you that that's true. But I mean, I'm pretty sure that if I actually went and wrote something sensible for a C++ compiler, it would be a lot faster than LLVM. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous. It's not doing that much work. Like a million lines of code isn't that many lines of code. Uh, well, I, I don't know <laughs> what to say to you. You you have to you have to just go and try to re reimplement it better. I, I I mean, well, okay. So just let me kind of tell you what are the bottlenecks in in the LVM, right? So well, it's a it's a giant code base, right? So first, you, you know, you are actually you know accessing uh, many code pages, right? So you you have a lot of uh, ITLB misses and you know and and pressure on the iCache since since the code jumps all over. The, uh, the, the place, right? That's yeah, but first. why? But That's... why is the code base giant, right? So why is that the case? Well, it's because you have to handle all 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 the you know tricky details of of the compilation. But I mean, think like if if you ha, like, have you played like Call of Duty or something? Uh, maybe. Like, a have while you back, have you yeah. played have you played like Fortnite? You know. I, Fortnite, no. I'm 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 an old school guy. <laughs> okay. Well, if you look at something like a modern video game, right, where you have, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of entities and you're drawing literally, you know, uh 27 million triangles frame, right? And you've got all these shader graphs and all this other stuff. I mean, th just think about like what's going on there, right? Uh how is it possible like, how could it possibly be the case that there's the LLVM code base is so huge that it's going, it had to be written that way compared to something that does all of these other things that you look at and is doing way more complex stuff visually as well as all, as well as having, you know, servicons and user input and all this other stuff, voice chat. And yet something that all it does is input a text file and output a binary. The argument that is that that is just an unsolvable problem. It's like, no, the code has to be 100 megabytes of code for that. Like, there's no way we're going to be able to get that down. I mean, how likely is it? You know that there are C compilers, right, obviously, that are minuscule. Now, the argument is that, well, if we want to add LLVM's features, there's no way to do that without multiplying the size of the code by, like, close to 100,000. How likely is that? Like, how likely do you think that really is if what we were focusing on was just, we're going to do simple code that does the operation we're trying, and we're not going to introduce other stuff. Use hundreds of classes or hundreds of templates. We're not going to have all of these weird inheritance hierarchies. We're not going to think about any of that. We're just going to look at how do we generate code and work backwards? How do we generate machine code? And we're going to work backwards from there. Do you really think, you know, it should be, you know, uh, I don't know how many megabytes the executable is. 30, 40, 50, 100? L L LVM? How many megabytes total is the whole thing, machine code-wise? The text uh, segment of LVM is about, I think, 60 to 70 megabytes. 70 megabytes. You think there's no way to do it in less than 70 megabytes. And I mean, we shouldn't really say 70 megabytes because that's not all going to actually have to be touched, potentially. Uh, but, you know, whatever the amount is that we're actually using. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that there are no mitigations to that. You can, you can, you know, you can group all the hot functions. Well, if you know the profiling data, of course, right? So if, if you have the profiling data, then you can PGO and, and you know, eventually get rid of that problem. But, you know, the, the, there are other things 
that are inherent again to the compilation process, right? So again, like if you are looking at the branch, right, and you have if else, it's I mean it's not that easy. It's, it, the, the, those branches are not super predictable, you know, from 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 the CPU perspective, uh, and that's I mean that's just the the randomness, if you will, the entropy of the workload. That's not uh, that is just you know there. I, I mean even if you if you you know. If you, I mean, there's even no way how you can how you can help the compiler here. Oh, I'm sorry, the the, the CPU here. I mean, I just... are you sure? Because there are oftentimes a lot of ways that we do that, right? I mean, for example, when we do SIMD programming, we deal with this all well, the time. Yeah, right? you, you you can do pre pre predication. I, I I agree. Like C moves and you know invert branches to C moves, right? So you you I mean, like in some cases, yes, you can do it. But uh, you know, you, 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 like people are usually very care very careful about this, right? Because you know, again, uh, when you convert branch to a uh, to a predication, you effectively convert a um, a, a code flow dependency and you know into into a data flow dependency, right? So the, you kind of you know you 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 should really think twice, uh, you know, when you do that, right? Well, it depends how you're doing it, but it you know. It, it, like doing SIMD, then you pretty much always want to do it because you're only going to do a not branch on if everything goes the same path. Well, but uh, for, sure, if you're doing C move, then it's in, different, in, in right? LVM, uh, there, there is zero version in, in LLVM's code. Yeah, uh, like, I know, almost, almost but that's zero. because of how they wrote it. Guys, guys, one point, one point of order. We have a lot of listeners, and we want everyone to be able to ask questions and get in on a discussion. So, Sorry, guys. So people who are on the call, if you want to ask a question, request a mic and someone will grant you the mic. We do have one question from Matt. He put he put his question in the, uh, in the chat, so I'm going to read it for him. Uh, it's to you, Casey. He says, LLVM has a ton of users with very different use cases, which to extent drives the resulting necessary complexity. A closer comparison may be Unreal Engine, which is also known for complexity and heavy use of runtime dispatch for better or for worse. So I think it's for more, I think it's more fair to compare a general compiler framework like LLVM to a general purpose game engine like UE rather than a single game like Call of Duty. Um, I guess, although I, it would be a little bit weird because Unreal Engine wasn't made that way because of licensability so it actually works that way just because that's the way it works and the same is true of call of duty like their engine is going to be very much the same kind of design right but in either case all i'm trying to say is if you look at those engines they're able to do this these very very complex workloads and usually what you can see is if you go look at how they're actually keeping their code base segregated, you won't see all of these crazy like hierarchies and things like that in the parts of the code base that it actually matters, right? Like in the places where they have to do stuff like Nanite or something like this, they'll make sure that those parts are free of these kinds of you know dynamic polymorphism things. They figure out ways to structure the code such that that's not what happens. And that is, simply not possible in LLVM at this point because nobody did that work, right? Nobody kept those sections of the code that were going to be difficult for performance clean in that way, in that kind of clean. They kept them the other kind of clean, which is the clean in code, quotes, which is about other things besides delivering the proper end product, which is the fast product. Now, I'm not trying to claim Unreal Engine's architecture is good. I'm sure there's tons of waste in the Unreal Engine architecture. I mean, you look at it and you're like, oh man, there's tons of waste in here. That's still a pretty bad case, don't get me wrong. It's just, it's doing a tremendous amount more work. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how else to say it. When you look at something like LLVM, you're like, well, you know, we don't use SIMD, but why not, right? You can use vector complete stuff in almost everywhere. But in order to use it, you have to have thought about your problem in terms of some kind of batching first. And you have to have kept virtual function calls and things like that out of the parts of the code where you're actually going to do that kind of batching, right? When you're 
in the places where you're going to try and process things quickly, you can't really have all of these things where you're expected to do dispatch into code that you can't see all the time, right? It's gonna be a thing. And so if you look at how someone like Unreal Engine handles this, if you want to support, for example, the person in the question asked, like having other people need to do stuff with it, you'll note what they do. Like Unreal Engine ships all kinds of things that are designed to prevent you from having this problem with user added stuff. They do things like blueprint, blueprint or something which they can then optimize under the hood or things like that. They do things like in Nanite when you su uh, supply shaders, they do a bunch of work to figure out everything that's going to happen before they start to con consider the shaders so that they can do all of the things that happen on any given path in a shader at the same time. Right. This is a big way that they speed up the way that they do multiple having actual multiple code paths that have to execute. Right. Whereas nothing like that can it's, it's not even conceivable that you could do that in LLVM because the architecture is such that you don't even have that knowledge. Right. You simply have to operate in this land of blind types and there's no way you're going to now kind of reorganize the architecture toward that. Are there any questions that the audience, does anyone want to request a mic? Yeah, I have one request. I'm going to grant him. Um... Oh, no, sorry. That's Ivica. There was another person before. I think it was Ginger Bill. Do you want to re request? No. Okay, Vita, he's joined. Welcome, Vita. Uh, you're on mute, Vita, if you're talking. Yeah, hi. You're having really nice conversation. It is really enjoyable to, to listen to it. So I, I was following the arguments made by Marco, but I, I agree with Dennis with you, just the type of workloads that the Unreal process, that the Unreal Engine does compared to the things that the, the compiler typically does, it's it's really they're different kind of let's say like this, you have two types of workloads. One is the computational processing and one is the lookup. Uh, so one is the data processing, one is the data lookup, and uh, the games would fall under data processing and the, the compilers would fall under data lookup. And these data lookup are not that seemed friendly. It's really difficult to implement. And bear in mind that the LLVM is a really complex software just for the, what it does. And to add a studio on top of it, it can be much, 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 much more complicated. Yeah, because, because, because the, the parallelism is not in the code, it's in the data, right? Yeah. So the, the, the parallelism is, is how you actually access memory and, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. It's not about, you know, uh, I, mean, I mean, if you're, if you're accessing data, like, you know, and, uh, like not, no, uh, how, how should I put it? Uh, I mean, you know, um, not in a temp temporal friendly way, then you cannot even, you know, uh, employ CMD here. Right. Yeah. So you have to kind of access sequentially. If you do pointer chasing, right? Yes. You cannot employ employ SIMD. Uh, you can employ SIMD, but uh, a different. You cannot like because of this instruction dependency. You cannot like the classical way. You need to think about a uh, big big thing like processing data in a, in a processing data. Well, in parallel. Hold on. Yes. I, I mean, just to be clear, maybe. If we're if we're talking strictly about CPU, I agree that pointer chasing on a CPU in SIMD is difficult. But I mean that's a separate topic we can sort of get into whether LLVM really needs as much pointer chasing as it's doing. But no, pointer chasing is totally SIMDizable. That's in, that's what a GPU is, right? A GPU is a giant machine for chasing pointers. I mean that's its entire architecture, no, right? No, it's no, a SIMD no. pointer chasing machine. Uh, I don't think so. So uh, imagine, uh, think about in the terms of STD transform. So the things that that uh, that uh, that the graphic engines do, the the type of processing you can easily 
make them uh, express them in the terms of std transform you have in c++ whereas the things that the compiler does this this tree lookup so this tree visiting you cannot express them easily in, in std transform way so no, think, no, no, no. The, the essential of std transform is that it has unlimited parallelism inside it that kind of workloads and they can be easily parallelized and the, the compiler the, the things that compiler do they just have nodes and linking uh, nodes going from one node to another node. So all nodes are of different types. That kind of uh, that kind of approach. This kind of approach you cannot. It's the code itself has a really low level of instruct available instruction level parallelism. If and if you need to add to it, it's much more complex than these codes that are that are really just processing vectors and processing arrays. Well, just to be clear, right? So there's two things. Pointer chasing is not what you just said. Right. So just to be I was just talking about the pointer chasing part. So GPUs are definitely made for pointer chasing. This is why they have giant queues, right? Because typically one of the things you do all the time is you have dependent texture lookups and things like that, which is exactly what that is. It's a pointer chase, right? And nowadays we do all sorts of things like traversing, you know, spatial partitions inside shaders. What are those? Those are pointer chasing. So that is how GPU stuff works nowadays. There's a ton of pointer chasing. You do these sort of requests to go get what some you know scattered set of things is across some you know kind of structure that you're looking into that you've encoded in the GPU's memory, and then it just goes on to another hyperthread, right? While it's waiting for those to come back. That's why they have those deep, those super deep queues of things going out to the memory units because that's you know. That's how a GPU works. Now, I agree that if you don't think about it ahead of time and you're not trying to go for performance, and by the way, this gets away from clean code because now we're just talking about optimization. But yeah. if you actually sit down and go, how much of LLVM really actually is not code level parallelizable and how much of it? Your argument is, well, none of it is. Right, And I just know that because I'm looking at this code base and I see all these different classes and there's all these different virtual functions and they all obviously do different things. I absolutely am sure <laughs> that that is simply not true. Anytime I've ever tackled a problem like this, and we do this all the time in games because our entities and gameplay code look like this. So actually, if you want to go optimize something where you're like, oh, the game designer said, well, if this thing is on fire and it has this other thing, then we need to do this this part. And then if it's not, we have to go do this other thing. And right, we've solved problems that look exactly like LLVM. Gameplay code is exactly like LLVM. And so if you want to go optimize that code, you would be surprised at how many similar code paths you can end up collapsing down into the same code path when you can actually look at them and when they're clear what's actually going on, as opposed to a giant sprawling inheritance hierarchy where you're never going to find that out, right? Because it's been so segregated and so artificially separated that no two things that actually would have been the same code path will ever get coalesced. They'll never even get noticed. Maybe when the AIs arrive. I, I, and so. The question for uh, I I'm not a G, I don't know I don't program GPUs I, I don't know about a lot about these things but the question for you is is there any type of compiler that they can actually run that can actually execute a GP uh, use have profit from GPUs in a significant way small compilers experimental compilers anything I don't know ever tried that but it sounds kind of interesting. Um... There's probably some researcher somewhere who's done it, I would imagine. I don't know. I mean, because there's when I've read research papers, I'm always sort of shocked at what people try to put on the GPU. So the fact that people have tried to put everything on at some point usually means you can find someone who did something. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to make a compiler on a GPU. I, I'm asking this because, I mean, this is a important thing for developers because it will save a th not thousands, millions of hours of development work of power and everything else. So we definitely would profit from having a compilation that is fast and can uh, can 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 take advantage of Accelerator. Now, the way the LLVM is written now, it just that's not possible. So you cannot move it to a different kind of, you need to probably, if you want to take the, the, the data-oriented approach, you need to take that in account from from beginning, and probably, uh, for example, I I watched some. Uh, it was uh, some mm, talk about data oriented design and entity uh, component system. Yeah. 
uh, but it was related to animations in web browsers. But actually, when it comes to taking that approach and impl implementing a compiler, that is completely unfamiliar. Nobody has ever done it, you know? So th the question is, is it possible? Maybe, but nobody has ever done it because you need a guy who is expert in compilers, but also expert in that stuff as well. Well, this, also, is, a, this, is, an, this is an unknown term. Also, you have to... Uh, so... For people like me, it wouldn't matter because the cost to transfer, you know, like I keep my compile times extraordinarily low. I, I, our current all build compile times here are down in the like one point something seconds uh, for like all, we run them parallel obviously, but for all, uh, what is it? 12 build targets. So from a perspective of someone like me who wants everything to be very fast, it wouldn't really matter much because the time it would take you to transfer your code over the GPU would probably be too much. Now, maybe if you imagine a hypothetical scenario where the IDE is also on the GPU or something, the problem is that running a compiler on a GPU, yes, it has better scatter, much better scatter gather because of like deeper hyper threading and deep queues. But it's not that well suited to a compiler because the, what they hyper optimize on is floating point units. Right? So you're not really going to be using floating point units for compilation. I mean, it doesn't really do floating point math. So my assumption would be that moving a compilation to a GPU isn't very good because most of the ops you're doing are going to be binary ops that the uh, actual GPU doesn't have as many more of, right? I mean, you look at something like a Skylake, I don't remember, but I want to say that um, it's got, what, like five things that can do a binary op on it or something, right? Like five execution ports. It's very high, whereas it only has two execution ports that can do something like an FMA, right? So it CPUs have a lot more binary processing power, so the, the, the multiplier you get by going to a GPU for ALUs is not going to be that great. So a compiler doesn't get a lot of that advantage. Yes, it could take advantage of those deep queues um, for doing things like scatter gather if you wanted to do some kind of cool SIMDI's compiling that we're hypo hypothesizing exists. And that would be better than on the CPU because gather on the CPU so... But you're not getting the main advantage. You're not getting the thing that's why GPUs seem so much faster when they tackle scientific workloads, because they have just so much more FMA, right? So, so turning this to more of uh, the future, uh, we see more videos popping up, various conferences, whether it's CPPCon or uh, meeting C++. You see a lot more data-oriented design presentations going forward. You, you got the uh, the curriculum that you're coming up with that you, I, I get you partnering with Practical Engineer or something like that to do these weekly videos. Is that true, uh, Casey? Is it Practical Engineer that you're... Uh, what is Practical Engineer? Sorry, I don't think I'm familiar with this. I forget what... what platform have you been releasing these videos on on a weekly basis i, I forgot the name of it uh oh it's computerenhance.com thank you computer enhanced so so you you have what you're doing on computer enhanced you have all these data oriented design presentations that have been going on for the past i want to say they've been increasing over the past three four years do you see are you optimistic at all that it'll get better in the future when it comes to uh coding for performance and not being so stringent on a, a clean code religion. Um, so I guess what I would say is it's hard to gauge because you don't know how many people are listening. Um, there's always been a core of people who are performance oriented. And I'd like to draw a distinction between performance oriented and performance aware, which I'll do in a second. So, there's always been a subset of programmers who are performance oriented. And these are the people who are the reason that something like, you know, uh, the Unreal Engine can still run very fast, right? Because if you look at something like the Unreal Engine, a lot of it is written in a similar way to something like LLVM, right? All of the, the, the stuff outside the performance core, right? Um, and so you've always had this breakdown of 
there's some percentage of coders who know about performance and focus on that in their code, and some percentage who don't, and the percentage who don't is very high. So I don't know whether the kinds of things that like I'm doing, for example, are reaching anybody new, or if they're just part of the training for the next generation of those same percent people who were already going to be performance oriented, but maybe they would have used some slightly different resources to get there, right? So I don't know whether to be optimistic or not about the future. But what I will say is that the sort of the mentality isn't great. I mean, even on this conversation, right? So our default when looking at something like LLVM and thinking about the task it actually has to do should be obviously this thing should go a lot faster, right? To me, that just seems like a natural thing to assume because looking at the code, it's clearly not set up for performance in any way. And uh, it's massive and sprawling, right? For a lot of reasons I don't think are quite valid. So if we were, if you were like, hey, Casey, uh, your job for the next 10 years is going to be you're going to make a uh, replacement for LVM that's really fast um, or twice as fast or 10 times faster or whatever the number is you want to pick. I'm not going to be like, well, that's just impossible. But that sounds like sort of what was happening in this conversation. Like, no, LLVM, that's that's as fast as it gets, man. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, really? Or, uh, how is it? So, you know, I think that attitude is everywhere right now um and it makes this really bad headway right so i think if people were just more like yeah performance is really bad and we should probably start to change the way we're doing things so that code bases don't get into these states and that we're checking our performance a lot more frequently and thinking about these things and actually analyzing whether maybe if we run into these problems um such as well there's a lot of pointer to things going to happen here maybe we need to take a step back and go like, okay, is this something that we now need to start actually doing? Because think about it this way. People look at things like, you know, games and they're running very fast. And what they say and what was said on this conversation was that, well, they're just different. No, they're not. They're not different. The reason they appear to be different is because people spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out how to do things that would have looked just like LLVM, but we came up with techniques to make that not happen, right? Things like Nanite are giant efforts spanning multiple years to figure out how to not make the code run slow and that's why it looks different. So if instead of looking at LLVM and saying, well, that, that's how it goes, pointer chasing, sorry, let's go home. If instead we were like, no, this can be instant, let's figure out how, yeah, is it gonna take us five or six years of doing new experiments on how we phrase things? Do we do new things that are different than abstract syntax trees? Do we need to change the way that we're doing compilers? Do we need to make modifications to these languages that we upstream to people where we're like, you know what? We need these three things now because that will make compilers much faster. Here are our recommendations to language start. We're doing none of that, <laughs> right? We're doing none of these things. And so I think, the attitude needs to shift to, well, that's just the way it is, or we're getting these other benefits, so it's fine, to it's not fine. And if we shift the attitude to it's not fine, I think we would be surprised at what we could accomplish, because all of these things we point to in things like games, we say, well, they're different, that's why they run fast. We made them fast. They used to be slow, or we didn't used to know how to do that. Yeah, yeah, so I, I haven't in, called that. So, sorry, Mark, there is Ginger Bill has been patiently waiting, so I'll let him speak and then we can get back to it. Did they request, did they request a mic? Yep, yep, I granted them. Uh, you may be muted. Whoever hey, good, good evening, everybody. Anyway, I'm, I'm Ginger Bill. Um, I guess I got the mic. Bill, hello. Hello, Casey, how, how are you doing? Great. How good, are you? Good, good. Just a lot of LLVM talk here, and um, I find it very just just to put in anyway. Just to know, tell people who I am. I am the creator of the Odin programming language, and I work uh, as my main job at Django Effects, working on like Embergen and Liquigen and Geogen, which are all real time simulation stuff like for fluids and terrain and such like that. So it's all very high performance stuff. 
But one thing as regarding LLVM, because I work on Odin, which is the uh, programming language, I've been working on with LLVM pretty much daily for the past seven years. So I know the LLVM code base pretty damn well at this point, and also the history about how LLVM got to its point. Um, LLVM is, for lack of a better word, a lot of accidental stuff, because you have to understand LLVM was originally a university project that got bought out by Apple, then got developed and made into its own compiler, and then got branched off into its own thing. So LLVM doesn't even mean what it meant originally, which was clearly a low-level virtual machine. LLVM just means nothing nowadays as the actual acronym. It's just a term. But yes, so some things I've been listening here, and I've just been a, bit, a little bit confused um, because people have been misunderstanding like the essential aspects of how you have to structure a, a static single assignment compiler as combined with um, the accidental things of like the history of how LLVM became. LLVM itself, the idea behind it to be the static single assignment, which is effectively, if people want to know, that's a, it's kind of like, let's say it's a kind of a semi-pure functional uh, high-level assembly language, which is based around a lot of graph theory to do a lot of the optimizations. Um, the way that LLVM has been org organized is very traditionally like very OOP, and it has evolved over the years, obviously, in the past 20 years that it's been around. But there is no intrinsic reason why it has to be organized the way it is. And I think a lot of the confusion here is just assuming like, well, LLVM is this way, and if we will get LLVM, it's a lot of work. And the answer is yes, but the essence of LLVM didn't have to be org architected anything like this at all. And um, it was just kind of like, look, and I know this is the case because I'm making my own LLVM replacement at the moment. And also I know a colleague, a friend who's also doing this as well. And because we've gotten fed up of LLVM because it's so slow. It is literally, for, for our work, it is 95% of the entire compile time. So, and we know LLVM used to be faster as well back in the past. In versions three, four, and five, it was a hell of a lot faster by like three times compared to the latest versions. So something's gone on and it's not the levels of optimizations. The code base has just gotten worse and worse over the years. But I digress, that's what I was trying to put in here is just kind of a lot of things that made no sense to me when people were commenting on it because it was kind of like, I know LLVM very well. This, this is, doesn't have to be this way. It just happens to be this way because of history. Thank you for your comments, Ginger yeah. Bill. What, what, what's your name? Or should I just call you Ginger Bill? You can call me anything you want, Bill, Ginger Bill, Ginger. I don't really care. <laughs> Thank you for your <laughs> are there Are there any other comments or questions? <laughs> Russell, we have a lot of people on the, the uh, Twitter space, so I just want to make sure that we have a variety of people asking questions and comment or making comments if they want to. So I just want to to agree with uh, with Casey. You have at least my full support. Uh, yes, we are a bit pessimistic about what's actually possible, and and we should we like as a community would should definitely strive to investigate and understand the the limits of performance compiler the clang actually the compilers are actually a really good example of that of, of what we are trying to do to understand what are the limit performance for that kind of workloads and they are they are definitely difficult they're I don't want to say difficult, but different to optimize what, for example, what the games. The gamers have developed, the game developers have developed their own it works well for them. The compiler developers don't still haven't done that so that's something that is hopefully in the future and hopefully good i have i mean well, in my head they have i have an idea of how that might work but i'm not sure i i I just, I just want to say that you know well okay i i, I don't defend the performance of lvm obviously right i i i agree it, it, it is not perfect for sure many many you know performance bottlenecks but i say that uh, there is not just a one solution like hey let's just throw away all the code base and rewrite it right uh, I'm I'm pretty much assure you that there are you know other solutions like for example you can attack this from this from the hardware perspective itself right you can design just a a better chips that will that will you know handle those bottlenecks you know better right even even take this pointer chasing right yeah I, I mean there were n n numerous you know attempts for you know just to optimize this problem right so for example there is this um, 
smart prefetching you know implemented in apple chips right m1 and m2 so they they do this kind of you know they try to you know uh, prefetch they look at the byte stream that they fetch from from memory and they try to and, and they try to identify pointers and try to you know kind of speculatively prefetch them ahead of time another solution to that is just you know value prediction right so again it's something that can be implemented in hardware right we can we can just break those dependency chains by by predicting you know the uh, the values it, I, I I'm not saying it is easy right uh, but it's but rewriting the code base is also not easy so yeah so we we've been talking about changing this from the ground up with uh you know the presentations at the different conferences and we have the efforts that casey's undertaking with uh computer enhanced and his series of videos but do you think that there's going to be a shift toward your view coming up with uh the 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 explosion and cloud costs so now, you know, the performance pessimization, it really has a bottom line uh, impact on monthly bills when you're coming from the, the cloud standpoint and you got the CFO seeing these bills every month because the performance of the software is not optimal. So, you know, you, you have all these articles coming up about people trying to curb their cloud costs and even considering... Uh, repatriation of their applications so do you think there's going to be pressure coming from the top down as well to think more about performance for software and not so much on uh this emphasis on clean code as you described well uh two things about that one is i don't have a lot of insight into that sort of thing um because i just don't know what you know i'm not in the boardrooms of these companies so i don't know what kind of pressure that really is going to exert on people obviously that would be great if there's a market force for this um but at the same time they're already kind of are market forces for a lot of these things and the reason that they don't produce performance software is because the computer industry is kind of, or software industry i should say is Probably because it's still kind of in its infancy. I mean, we're, we're we haven't even completed a hundred years of, com of commercial software yet. There just isn't enough competition. A lot of times with these companies, you know, you could take something like the thing we're using to do this on Twitter. There aren't really that many competitors for Twitter once you factor in the, the lock-in effects of like a social network and things like this. It's not really like people can come in and compete with them on performance, right? Like things are bundled together. If you want to use Facebook, you have to use Facebook. You can't use some high performance version of Facebook that another vendor sells. So performance has kind of always been a value add. I mean, the reason people bought iPhones was because it was the first performant phone that smartphone, right? I mean, Windows CE had all the same stuff. It had more stuff actually, but it was clunky and slow and it wasn't 60 frames a second dragging things around with your finger. So, and the same, I often use the example of MapQuest and Google Maps, right? Where's MapQuest now? Well, it's not because Google Maps came out with something where you could drag the map, right? Um, so, you know, performance has always been a thing that you can use to differentiate your product. Uh, and it always has been a market force, but the bottom line is that there just isn't severe enough competition and there's way too much monopoly lock-in of software to make it really be something that, we're, that we see during the way people program. And that's too bad, but that's just the reality of it. Yes, you can, in some certain circumstances, assail somebody on the performance front. Um, and we see people coming up with companies now, for example, where their value add is, you know, this is an actual fast IDE, right, instead of a slow one. Or this is a fast JavaScript runtime. This is a fast Python, you know, substrate, whatever. So, yes, you know, you see it in limited cases where people can target something and they're not blocked by some other market force. But other than in those circumstances, it's very hard to see how people who just focus on performance can necessarily ship competing products because a lot of these products have so much lock-in that merely shipping a more performant version isn't a way, isn't going to work, right? Because there's these other, you know, monopoly is a big problem in our industry across many uh, aspects. So 
with respect to cloud, I'm like, well, yeah, I can see what you're saying. That bottom line is different because now we're talking about the monopolist and the monopolist themselves is sitting there going, I want to keep this money. And instead I'm handing it over to Azure or I'm handing it over to AWS. Maybe that's a big difference because now the monopolist has the problem and they will take steps to solve it inside themselves, which previously a competitor couldn't do because they couldn't assail the monopoly for other reasons. And so they couldn't come in with a product that was more performant. Could I believe that would happen? Sure. Do I have any optimism about it or pessimism? I just, I just don't know. Um, so I guess I'd have to say I'm not sure. On the second part, which is like uh, what you know, we're kind of trying to do with stuff, I like to draw a distinction, I just want to make it here, between optimization and performance awareness. So on Computer Enhanced, the core performance aware programming, not optimization. Why? Because I honestly am not really an optimization person. I don't spend most of my time optimizing code. What I see broadly in the industry is that a lot of the recommendations we make and the way we teach people to program result in slow code by default. And if we just taught them different practices, they would get fast code by default, not optimized code. There's still a person who knows optimization could step in and do a much faster version. But I think what we're facing right now as an industry is we don't really have to think about how do we get programmers to output the optimal code? Because we're so far away from optimal code that if we just focused on getting programmers to not do stuff that's, you know, a hundred or a thousand times slower than it should be, which is a typical range you see today, um, a typical non-multi-threaded Python program running through the interpreter, like a thousand times slower, <laughs> right? For example, um, that I showed de demonstrations of this, for example. Uh, so if we just move people into things that were faster by default, I think that would be enough. Performance, oh, just making decisions that result in better performance, I think is all we would really need to get most of the win. And I think most programmers can learn those things and unlearn the things they've been taught, which, which are actually bad. So I do want to express some optimism there in that I don't think we have to teach everyone how to count cycles and how to like optimize things wide and all that other stuff necessarily. I think there are things we can do to get a lot of that multiplier back that don't require people to become experts in optimization. Fantastic. Uh, we're at the 90 minute mark. Do we want to start wrapping up now or? I think that was, because in my opinion, I thought that Casey's last statement was a great way to sum up the, his goals and what our goals should be as performance engineers. But what do you guys think? Should we, do we want to continue? Is there another question that we did? No, I'm, I, I, I'm just thinking whether there is any any way how you know how how uh, how we can help it you know differently because um, like is there a, a, any way how compilers can can get better you know at uh, at optimizing this kind of clean because well I mean even even you know just take this uh, virtual function call as an example right so again there are some efforts like uh, compilers do uh, the virtualization again or again it's just it's not perfect, right? Obviously, it's not. It's not solve all the cases. But uh, I, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if, if there is any way how how you know how we can get help, in, you know, just 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 you know fixing uh, those slow code bases. Uh, what do what do you think, guys? I do think there is a possibility for that. I think C++'s compilation model is a bit broken, right? Um, C++ has a lot of problems with this. But if you imagine a different compilation model that was maybe memory resident more general or something like that, you could imagine a system in which the compiler could analyze across virtual function calls. And I imagine that the spec probably doesn't allow them to do this, but suppose that the spec did. Like, I'm not saying the spec does because the C++ spec is like impenetrable, right? But like, Let's suppose that it had authorization from the spec to do so. There's no real reason you can't turn a bunch of classes into, you know, 
unions and switch statements or anything else, right? They are interchangeable. The problem is just like the compiler is kind of required at this point to do the V table thing. And it also usually doesn't have knowledge of all of the implications because the oftentimes the reason the person did it was to hide the implementation, right? So you could imagine moving towards a system where the compiler could do more for you. Um, but I mean, that requires a lot of people to do a lot of things. So, uh, I mean, it's a, so it's a social issue, right? You have to go convince a bunch of people to do a bunch of things to get that to happen. But if you can, I don't think there's any technical reason there couldn't be this idea of like, hey, I, I replaced the word class, or I added a, a attribute to the class called like switchify or whatever. <laughs> Um, or or devirtualize, I think was the word you used. I don't see any practical reason it can't do that. Are you and Bob? Are you and Bob going to do a podcast or what? I don't think so, but um, <laughs> I haven't heard of it. If if we are, okay. Th this has been great. Uh, I think it's been a yep. fruitful discussion. Uh, we're four minutes over. Casey, thanks so much for joining uh, our Twitter uh, spaces. No we really appreciate your time. Uh, it's, uh, very fruitful. Oh, yep, thanks for was, having me it on. Was great. It was great. Yep. Thanks, guys. Right, have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Speak soon.